Follow me with your shape shifting smiles and I see you. Maybe they'll believe you. Illuminati, a cold dawn trap. Silver discs and hidden files and we see you. We've got to believe you. Absolutely amazing intro by the one, the only, Ryan Spivey of Spivey underscore music on Instagram. Definitely support his work. Coolest space cowboy in the game and super knowledgeable of everything strange. And uh, moving on, welcome to the Hero Paranormal Podcast. We are the one, the only hyper anomalous esoteric research organization podcast, a.k.a. Hero Paranormal. My name is Ryan, the anomalous ambassador of the airwaves, broadcasting from SpaceWolfResearch.com. And have we ever got an amazing, amazing interview today? A person I've been waiting to talk to for quite some time. Her name is Karen Wilkinson, and she has, well, a lifetime of alien abduction scenarios. We're going to dive deep. Before we do, if you haven't had a chance to head on over to heroparanormal.com, please do a ton of content over there. Check it out. And don't be afraid of that subscribe button for the price of a cup of coffee a month. You can access all of the content behind there, the whole enchilada. And um, there's a ton of it. Also, if you prefer to purchase tangible items to help support the podcast, head on over to the shop there at heroparanormal.com or head on over to happinessmedical.com. Anything you purchase there also helps support the podcast. All right, let's get to it. This is going to be amazing. If you haven't heard of Karen Wilkinson, well, then you must be living under a rock She has an amazing abundance of information having to do with the, well, alien abduction phenomenon. And she has a very amazing book you can access at KarenWilkinsonAuthor.com. That's K-A-R-I-N-W-I-L-K-I-N-S-O-N. A-U-T-H-O-R dot com. And it is featured by Dr. L.A. Marzuli. You can also access it at lamarzuli.net. And this book, Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest, is a true account of lifelong alien abduction and the evil alien agenda. The book details non-human alien entities, intervening with humans, their attempt to corrupt human bloodlines, and a warning about their nefarious plans. There's also a YouTube three-part series you can access through lamarzuli.net on Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest. There's a bunch to cover here, and Karen is someone who has, I believe, a lot in common with myself. She has a lot of faith. She's looking at this from a very stable perspective. And she's going to go into it. She's going to go into some of the more difficult topics about this. Why they're here. Why they come at night. What happens when a person is abducted. And basically, what's the end game, right? What do the aliens want? And what are? UFOs and aliens. All these things are on the table. We're going to dive into a bunch of other questions as well. But this may be one of those episodes, the rare and few episodes where I say that discretion is advised. It's a dark subject matter, probably not best for kids. Definitely not best for kids, actually. But yeah, discretion is advised. 
So if you're squeamish, if you're not wanting to go down these uh, dark alleyways into the abduction scenario, let this be the discretionary warning beforehand. For those who are wanting to know what the evil alien agenda is, what non-human alien entities are doing with humans, and uh, wanting to know about their nefarious plans and what it has to do with human bloodlines, get ready to blast off. Here we go, guys. Karen Wilkinson, welcome to the Hero Paranormal Podcast. Ryan, hi. I'm so happy to be here with you again. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing a lot better now that I'm talking to you. This is super exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Always a pleasure to talk with you, Ryan. You know, you are one of the few cases where somebody has really brought something to light that a lot of people have tried to avoid. And um, that is the alien abduction scenario. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm just blown away with all of the work that you've put forth into not only telling your story, but kind of, you know, enabling others to understand what's really going on because it's a dark subject. Yeah, well, thank you for, for your kind words. It is a very dark dark subject, and it's very difficult to speak about. And, you know, I just feel so led to share because there are just so many people who want to share, want to talk about this, but are afraid to because there's just such a negative stigma around it. And that's that's really a shame because it affects so many people. I mean, you have no idea how many people I email with and talk with on a daily basis who are just struggling with this issue. It really is a huge issue. I've I've come across in in, in well, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna take away from you know the numbers, but when I, I've come across people in my past who I've talked to and to give you one example, one guy was really high up in um the mail carrier DHL. And he was being awarded with an award on stage in front of a huge conference. And, you know, he wasn't as well acclimated as, as you are. And as he was accepting this award, he went on after accepting the award to say, hey, just so you guys all know, you know, I'm being abducted by like reptilians. And I mean, everybody was shocked. And right. um, needless to say, he, he actually succumbed to one of the abductions and he's no longer with us. But this is an example of how real this is, right? Like people, a lot of people take it with a grain of salt. Oh, there's just, you know, some people who think this is going on. It There's, a, like you said, a very large segment of the population where this is a very real part of their daily lives. It is. And too many people to ignore. If, if it was just a random one or two people here and there, I could understand how it could be dismissed, but it's too many people. I mean, the numbers are staggering, and that's why I do this. I never expected to hear from so many people, and I expected to get a great deal of criticism. It takes a lot of courage to come forward with stories like this, but what I didn't expect was the number of people who came forward and thanked me for sharing because they didn't feel alone anymore. And the numbers are staggering. I mean, and I'm barely scratching the surface of getting this message out to people and sharing with people and, and reaching people. So I, I am amazed already at how many people are affected by this. Amazed. And you, you couldn't be in with a better group or camp or researchers. Uh, you're, you're with L.A. Marzulli, <laughs> who I respect very much. Yes, he's amazing and the best support system you can imagine and... You know, he is boots on the ground, not just talking to people and writing things down, but he's actually out there getting involved with people, getting going to sites, you know, researching. I mean, he went to Roswell. His last two movies were on Roswell, and he is boots on the ground, digging in the dirt, finding things, you know. I mean, just doing the real, real research to help support people like me and to help show the proof the physical evidence 
of what's happening. And, you know, without people like that, we wouldn't have the opportunity and the voice and the platforms that we have to share what we are sharing. So I am really grateful for people like you, people like L.A., and the myriads of other people out there who are supportive and helpful in this because it's important to be able to have these conversations. People just, they want to talk, and there's no one to talk to, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, and as you said, it is the data is staggering, and it, it's unfortunate because it seems as if these entities hide behind this veil or this ruse, right? They have this this um, this supernatural kidnapping narrative, which hides behind this this veil of secrecy, and it 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 almost is under disguise. So, let's. I guess where where do you want to start off? Should we start off with your youth and how this started off? Um, sure, absolutely. We can do that. I can kind of start with how the that and then kind of go into how the book came to be uh whatever you prefer that's fine with me that that makes sense to me i think that would be wonderful okay cool so yeah this was happening to me from my earliest memories i don't have a memories of when this wasn't happening by this i mean i was being taken um as a little kid um i was you know when my really concrete memories of around five or six year old Um, waking up at night and just feeling an evil presence in the room, feeling the darkness, being terrified, um, and sometimes seeing a light coming in the window or, you know, all the, everything outside would go silent. Um, and a very low hum would often accompany this, which a low, very low, getting lower with like a, just a deep bass type noise where it's almost like holding onto a bass speaker. It filled the air, your body, everything. And um, at that point, often I would see um, at least two, sometimes more, of what people refer to as a typical gray alien, which terrified me as a child. I was absolutely terrified. I'll never forget the first time I saw the communion book in a bookstore from across the store, and that face on the cover was the first time I had seen someone depict one of these grays um, on paper and I had a panic attack. I had to leave. I I just, and I couldn't tell anyone what was wrong with me because I was afraid they would think I was crazy. But I literally panicked um, because I've never been able to watch those shows or read the books because it was just so triggering for me at that point. Um, but um, so I would see a couple of those typical, what people call typical gray aliens. They're short, about three or four feet tall, huge, bulbous heads on tiny little thin necks with big black eyes that were like a screen. They weren't, they didn't move. They didn't look like a real eye. It just looked like a screen. And, uh, but the eyes, once you looked at them, you were just, I would be like uh, hypnotized. I always tried not to look. I would always cover my head with my blankets or close my eyes as tight as I could because I didn't want to look at them because I knew it would just paralyze me. Not just paralyzed with fear, but I would get You know, I know a lot of people might have heard of sleep paralysis, but also there's a thing like waking paralysis where you're awake and you're paralyzed. And I'd look at their eyes and instantly my body would just be paralyzed. Um, And there's just something about their eyes. I never wanted to look at them. Um, And they always wanted me to look at them, you know. Um, Sometimes I would let the bed at that point because I was so scared. Um, At that point, um, I would be in a paralysis type situation. I couldn't scream. I couldn't call for help. If I did have an opportunity to call for help, if there was someone else nearby or if a sibling was in the room, they would always be in a state of just such deep sleep, like they were shut off, shut down, and I couldn't wake anyone. Um, And at that point, I knew there was nothing I could do. You know, I just kind of gave into it. Um, I would be uh, levitated off the bed and just watch everything get further and further away in the room and sometimes up through a ceiling or through a closed window and be taken out of my home. Um, you know, uh, just terrifying, terrifying, because um, I didn't understand as a little kid how they were doing this, what they were doing. And I didn't even know who they were. You know, we didn't have vocabulary for who they were or what they were. I remember talking to an older sibling about that age of five, and we were having a conversation, and I was trying to figure out where to hide. I thought I could maybe hide from them at night. And she says to me, 
you know, they can see us through the house. It doesn't matter where you hide. And this is little kids having a conversation about them, but we don't know who they are. You know, they're just them, the ones who came to get me. Um, and uh, it was just a terrifying way to grow up. Uh, and I tried to talk about it. You know, I tried to tell my parents or kids at school or teachers, but I didn't have a good vocabulary. I get, you know, asked about why didn't you tell someone, and I did, but I didn't know what to call them. And I didn't know they were grays. I didn't know they were aliens or UFOs or anything like that. I didn't know those words. So as I was trying to talk about it, they um, one night they took me and walked me out to the backyard of my grandparents' farm and told me I had to stop talking about them. I wasn't allowed to tell anyone what was happening or they would hurt my family. And they showed me my family being marched out in front of me. And this was a screen memory. Um, A screen memory is a tool that they use where it's like putting on virtual reality goggles today. Back then we didn't have anything like that, so I wouldn't have even had a way to describe it. Um, But So it looks so real, but it's not. And they showed me what looked like my family being walked out in front of me. They sprayed something on their necks and said, if you talk, we'll kill your family. And showed me them being beheaded in front of me. And, you know, I was just a little kid. I was terrified. I was, it broke something in me at that point. And I really just lost it. Um, that's when, um, so shortly after that at school, they found me huddled in the corner of a bathroom stall just rocking. I wouldn't come out of the stall. I wouldn't talk. They had to call my mom to come get me, and she coaxed me out of the bathroom, and I just kept saying, I don't want them to take me. I don't want them to touch me. I don't want anyone to get hurt. She took me to the doctor thinking maybe someone was abusing me or something at school because that's all she could equate that to, you know, because she didn't know what I was talking about. Um, The doctor looked me over and said, well, whatever's happening, she's young. She'll forget. She'll be okay. Um... You know, this is in the 60s, 70s, so that was probably a typical response back then. We didn't have a lot of the awareness that we have today, right? Um, And I think that's when I really realized that I was stuck in this. There was no one that was going to save me. There was no one that was going to help me, and I just dissociated from it. I separated it from my life, and it was the abductions are happening here, and my life is happening over here, and I split those things into two. And I did not let them come together as much as possible. Do you know what I mean? It affected Mm -hmm. me. I was emotionally just seriously affected by this my whole life. But I did try very hard to to separate it from my life. I'll stop there in case you have any questions. Sorry, I kind of went on for a while. Yeah, wow. It is so... So, No, it, it, it really is something that we have not really had a way, a language, right, to discuss this until the 20th, 21st century. And it's, you know, prior to that, I guess there were some stories, you know, there were legends, myths, and, you know, the Fae, and people had, you know, other explanations for these things for the old, the old, from the old country. But sure, the reality is we're finding out that this has most likely been taking place since the beginning of man. And, you know, whenever you hear an insider's tale on the enigmas there are those similarities which i know you're very familiar with um where and yeah shocking that the doctor would say that but i can under you know it was a different time (laughs) and i didn't have anything obvious that they could work with right so it's not like you know there were it wasn't anything that he could utilize i mean there were scratches and bruises or marks or things like that but and they didn't understand what i was saying so yeah and, and, you know, the very, the very real probability, like you said, it was a different time, you know, to start talking about non-human intelligences visiting us at that time was much more taboo than it is now. And there's, for, for those who are unfamiliar, Karen's probably more familiar with these numbers than I am, but it is millions of Americans who are uh, interacting with these non-human intelligences, visiting them. And for anybody who's ever seen sleep paralysis or encountered it themselves, especially as a child, there's probably nothing more horrific or the waking paralysis because you, you, first of all, you can't, you can't get any words out 
You can't no. move. I mean, it's it's utterly shocking in and of itself, let alone the activities which come afterwards. So yeah, let's let's move along in the direction you want from there, Karen. No, yeah, no, you're absolutely right about sleep paralysis. And that makes me think of um, our friend Vicki Joy Anderson and her book, They Only Come Out at Night, um, exposing the um, dark weapons of sleep paralysis. She really does a deep dive into that and really helps explain that from a, a perspective that hasn't been... Um, approached before. So I highly recommend that for anyone who might be suffering from sleep paralysis because you really can have freedom from that. And and what we didn't understand then and what we understand now is all those things, the ancient myths, the things that are, you know, back into the biblical times and back into the most ancient of things from cave drawings to today, it's all the same thing. We're all dealing with the same thing. We just, we get different names for it, you know, different societies attach different names and, um, descriptions and, you know, ideologies to it, but well, it's really all the same thing. It always comes back to this good versus evil, the, and we are dealing with entities who are stronger than us, who are have been around a lot longer than we have. They can manipulate space, time, energy, and matter in ways that we just can't fathom, and we're always trying to put them in this little tiny box of, well, we live here on this planet, in this in this, um, you know, uh, dimension, and they don't fit into our little space. But we try to make them fit in. And if we do that, we'll never understand what we're dealing with. So that that also is a problem because for people who haven't had experiences and who haven't opened themselves up to listening to others who have, they don't, they won't understand if they don't allow for a little bit of expansion on who and what these things are, that they are interdimensional, that they are non-human, that they are um, entities that are much like said, much more advanced and, and farther advanced than we are. Um, do you have any questions before I continue? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, that is just such a huge, I do because that is such, this. you have hit on probably the most important aspect of this, which is people want it to fit into their box of understanding. The minute they hear this, they think, oh, little green men, that they fly, you mean the ones that fly in those flying saucers? And then the next question is, well, this doesn't compute. And like you said, it is much larger than that. You have to enter it with a very open mind because everything that we consider reality is denied by these entities. And you kind of have to uninstall the human programming because they are on a completely different agenda. They have a completely different different nefarious plan, and their abilities far outweigh what we would call reality. So I think you just nailed, I mean, you knocked it out of the park. But yeah, let, I think that's the biggest thing. It doesn't, it's not something you have to be able to label, put in a box, and it's that. It's just be open to what you hear, because it's the similarities, right? Not the differences in these encounters. Right, and it is still the Wild West when it comes to information because we're not being given good information. So what we get is either we get good information from people who've had direct experiences, but then there are people who like to call themselves researchers who are making a lot of assumptions. We've got the government and these other three-letter agencies and groups who are kind of spoon-feeding us very specific information that's quite often misleading. And so we have to be really careful about trying to figure out what exactly we're dealing with and how dangerous it really is. And and so I agree with you 100%. And I think uh, something you said really struck a chord with me because people like to see, think of the little Marvin the Martian, everyone, you know, marching off the spaceship and they all look the same and they're a little cookie cutter. And I think that's kind of true for the little grays that people see because those are a construct. They're a, like a... Um, avatar type um, entity that was created to do work for these entities. But when you get down to it, these entities are like humans in the fact that they are all different. They all look different. There may be reptilians, but they don't all look the same. They all look different. They're different sizes and shapes and colors and faces and things like that. And the grays, the actual grays, are the same way. There's some that are very large and some are very small. And then there's the Nordic types. And there's, I think there are books out there, which I haven't really looked at, but I know they exist, of, you know, saying that there are some thousands of different types of non-human alien entities. 
and I'm sure they're true, but they probably all boils down to a couple of specific types and just different variations on those types, um, just like anything else, you know, in God's kingdom. So, um, but it's so it gets very confusing to people when they try to look at it and create something that's compact and easily understandable. It's not. It's extremely complicated. Um, Huge, and, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's that's huge. That that's that's really big because that couples with the phenomena itself is, you know, all these various cultures and religions throughout at least what we call human time have all these different things that they they try to separate. And as you said, if these entities are dimensional in their very essence, just imagine the possibilities and how able they are to get, well, what it is they want, right? Which is kind of what we're, we're talking about. Exactly. And they can change their, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they can change their appearance. They can change, you know, how they appear to us and, and they can change so many, you know, our environment around us. So, you know, it's, we're, we're at, they are just, they have the upper hand in every, every way. And, and we have to, really understand it to protect ourselves we have to make sure we understand it better as best that we can which is difficult in this environment for uh, certainly but um yeah so uh as far as you know the information we're given yeah it's mostly <laughs> mostly misleading but with people like you people like ellie marzulli then there are opportunities to actually get some accurate information that will help us and to describe the the, the, I, and I really like that you come at this from a place of faith. I think that's super important and ideal in communicating about this enigma because that kind of plays into my next question, which is why they come at night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think there are a couple of things that have to do with that. I do, you know, a lot of that is going to be speculation um, on anyone's part, including my own. But what I've noticed is there seems to be, I believe, based on my research, and I'm not alone in this belief, that there have been changes to our Earth. We know there have been changes to our, our Earth, and um, that it's difficult for them to be in our direct sunlight. I believe that that's a part of why they're doing this um, attempt to create these hybrid entities, so they have proxies that can be here amongst us as uh, Dr. David Jacobs, the title of his book, Walking Among Us, is is titled for that very reason, because he believes they are walking among us, um, these hybrid entities that are a cross between these non-human entities and humans. Um, I, you know, it's everything in God's kingdom is very legalistic. There has to be certain permissions given for them to even show up. I mean, that you have to agree, just like in uh, the vampire stories of old, for an example. You know, you have to agree to that, and once those permissions are taken away, then they have to have permission to even approach you or take you. But someone else can give those permissions, too. I'm not trying to get too far off off of your question about, you know, why they can't come out during the day, but, you know, they only come out at night. Um, Vicki Joy Anderson really hits that topic a lot more succinctly in her book um, as far as the describing why and how that happens. But... Um, as far as the um, entities themselves, I do believe that they are the fallen angelic entities, you know, going back to a biblical and a faith perspective, um, and that they have a lot of restrictions on them as far as where and when they're allowed to roam among us. That is such an important thing. You, you, you've you led into, like, the, the, big, the big offering there because... Yeah, these these things are daunting in, in, in this modern landscape. A lot of people are unwilling to talk about, you know, the basic all-time archetype of this fallen angel, this very real probability that a non-human intelligence came down from, well, somewhere else and... Yeah. And, you know, yeah. And, and I mean, this is detailed throughout, you know, human history and civilizations. I, I, the most ancient texts talk about this. So I, I I always argue why, you know, it's the same story told a different way, right? 
Exactly, exactly. It's just like every society rebrands it to fit into whatever works in that society for that time and whatever's popular or acceptable. I mean, they literally could be walking among us now and we just don't see them because our minds can't comprehend them. Or maybe they're a color that we don't see. We know we only see a limited number of colors in the spectrum. Um, you know, so there's so many different reasons that we don't see them. It doesn't mean that they're not around us right now, that they're not everywhere. Um, biblically, you know, you look at Elijah and, and how, you know, he asked God to let his, his friends see the chariots of fire and see the angelic beings that were fighting with them and for them because his friend couldn't see them. You know, it could be a similar thing to that where we just don't see them, but they are here and they are all around us. And that's, I think that that's a, a very huge possibility when it comes to these entities. And I'm really glad that you mentioned Dr. Jacobs and, you know, walking among us, because this is something that others have said, uh, notably uh, for one, Mr. Robert Bigelow, who used to own the ranch my property here shares a fence line with, has said the same thing. And when attacked, he says, I don't care if you believe me. I know that they are walking among us. And I think that's a really good way to put it, that they are here right now right here, and um, many people are unwilling to open their minds to that possibility. Right, but these are the same people that will go to a haunted house around Halloween and let themselves get scared silly, or watch scary movies and be scared, or watch these ghost hunter shows and be like, oh, wow, that's really cool, knowing that they actually do believe these things, but they don't want to kind of bring it into their reality fully, mm -hmm. but these types of shows and things like Skinwalker Ranch and stuff like that would not be so popular if people didn't actually know and believe that this actually is the truth. So, you know, even in its denial, the strong denial is kind of, you know, it, it, they're, they're not denying it because of the popularity of all of these things, because it is all the same thing, the scary movies, the the ghost hunters, the skinwalkers, we're talking about the same types of things. Exactly. And this is unified into like, you know, that gut feeling that all humans have. It seems like this, uh, at some point or another, somebody has to say it, I'm glad you did, that this is a larger undertaking than just talking about one enigma. And this is something that kind of comes back to it's, it's hard to describe, but I hate to say it. It's, it's sort of soul science, right? There is something that these entities have. There's an agenda, and oh. it has to do with us and our bloodlines, potentially. Can we go into that a bit? Sure, absolutely. I absolutely believe that you're right when you say that. You know, you go back to Genesis 3.15, and you're in the Garden of Eden, and the Nakash, Satan, is tempting Eve, and... and then, you know, you have God in the garden amongst them and saying to uh, Satan, you know, your seed will be at enmity with the seed of the woman. And you will, he will, you will bruise his heel and he will crush your head. That sets up a seed war, a seed war that's going on today. And then we see that come into more fullness in Genesis 6, where it says the sons of God, the Bineha Elohim, these are the angels that, that fell saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and took wives, wives, plural, of all that they chose. So they were taking women at that point, taking wives of all that they chose, having relations with them, having offspring, which became the Nephilim, the mighty men of old, the Gibberim, different, you know, some were giants, some were tiny. They were all different. They weren't, again, this cookie cutter all looking the same. When you talk about Nephilim, people think it's just giants. It's just the giant bones. No, it's all different kinds. You know, they're not all red-haired giants. There's all different kinds throughout all the extra canonical books and throughout the Bible. You'll find all different kinds of descriptions of them. Um, and even descriptions in some of the books that, that say that they might have even had their own offspring, which is interesting. And we just don't have enough information um, in our historical literature to draw too much from it. But we've got enough to verify, especially in the biblical text, that this happened. Um, and then from there, you know, then you get Noah where God wiped these things out. You know, God wasn't 
everyone's, it's hard when you get to those points in the Bible and people read and they're like, oh, God, God just kills people. He wipes out entire worlds and nations and things. No, he was trying to save the human race by taking the evil out of the world, by taking these non-human entities out of the world, you know, and and then we find out from, like, the books of Enoch and Jasher and those books that the souls of those departed Nephilim were were cursed to roam the earth without bodies because they were neither of the heavenly realm or the earthly realm because they were a mix of the two. And that's where demons come from. So now we have these demons roaming the earth that want nothing more than to find a body to inhabit. And so these fallen angelic beings are utilizing these demons to do their dirty work and saying, yeah, we'll get you a body. We'll create a little gray alien for you. Or we'll you know, create a uh, modern-day Nephilim, you know, a hybrid being for you to inhabit or what have you. So it all goes back to this seed war that's going on still today. They want the earth back. You know, we were not the first ones here. We also know this from the Bible and other extra-canonical texts and ancient texts that there was a civilization, civilization here before us. Where do you think all the giant, you know, buildings, and I know you know this, all the giant structures and buildings came from. We didn't build those. Mm -hmm. And this is so, this is so huge because (laughs) this is not the stuff that they teach you in Sunday school. I mean, we could only (laughs) hope, right? But it would be nice, right? (laughs) It would be nice. It would be a perfect balance because people would probably take things a little more seriously that, Mm -hmm. you know, that those who have inherited the earth, let's just say, that that like you said, there's there's some disgruntled uh, previous occupants. Yes, definitely. And you know what does God do when, when these like, angels rebelled? And we know that there was the rebellion, and Satan fell and took a third of the angels with him because he wanted to be like God. Um, God took the earth away from them. And what did God do? He made a man out of the dirt and gave man dominion over the earth. And that really pissed Satan off. So he's been trying ever since then to corrupt the bloodline. He couldn't corrupt the bloodline to keep Jesus from being born. That happened anyway. He tried to kill Jesus. That didn't work out for him. Um, And um, so then you get, you know, today, he's still trying to corrupt the bloodline to gain, you know, birthright to this land, to this earth, and to just draw as many people away from the truth as possible. And you see that in... What's happening today with everyone saying, oh, these are benevolent space brothers. Oh, they want to help us. They're here to save the earth and, and you know, show us the way and enlighten us and take us to the next level and we're going to live forever. And that's just part of the great deception that the Bible talks about. And L.A. Marzulli calls it the coming great deception. And I think he's absolutely right with that. Yeah, deception is the these are tricksters, and we we all know about the tricksters from Sunday school. And you know, I find it really interesting that all cultures have this tale. Even the Lakota uh, have you know these these characters, these these um, disobedient entities with treachery against God or the gods, and they were banished. And, you know, cursed and exiled, as you said, but yet they're warning against them, meaning they're still visiting. And, you know, we're finding this in all cultures. And I really like how you you are, you're just, you're just focusing on all these things that a lot of other people are unwilling to look at. And I'm very, I'm very weary of the benevolent space brothers <laughs> so i'm glad you said that well thank you well yeah i just i cannot i cannot get behind kidnapping little children i was taken against my will i saw hundreds of people throughout my lifetime who were there while i was there who had been taken against their will they were not happy about it you know i do hear of people who say i had this wonderful experience with this et and you know, I don't disparage anyone else's opinions. It takes a lot of courage to come forward and speak up. And I will listen to anyone and whatever they want to share, and I will support them in that. But I cannot support the idea that these are benevolent space brothers when they are kidnapping little children, when they are raping women, when they are stealing, 
ovum from women and sperm from men when they are mutilating animals and people. I mean, in in uh, countries all over the world, not just here in our little space, but it's worldwide. I mean, the animal mutilations are horrific, but there are also human mutilations that you don't get to hear about because those are pretty much hidden in the press. So, you know, we don't hear about the things that are really going on. Agreed. And and as you said, if there's so many different types, that's another huge, you know, if there's this pantheon of cosmic non-human intelligences and entities, yeah, there's the off chance that one may be a little nicer than the other. And I don't think that takes away from the greater truth that, you know, why they're here and what they're doing. And that kind of leads into my next question. What is it that these quote unquote aliens want? Right. And to, to kind of back a tiny bit, a con man doesn't come up to you and say, hey, I'm a ruthless con man. No, he comes <laughs> up to you and becomes your best friend. A carjacker doesn't walk around with a T-shirt on that says, hey, I'm a carjacker or a thief or a rapist. They don't walk around with big signs announcing what they're going to do. That's how evil works. It is like a thief in the night. It comes in as something beautiful, and then it's really not. And it's deceptive. And so for them to come on with this, you know, benevolent space brothers and this new world religion of, you know, they have, they have a religion behind it, a, a movement behind it, and trying to, you know, we want to live forever kind of thing. And and that's the deception. And, and so the deception is something that is expected, but people are still very accepting of it, and, and it's crazy. And what they want is going back to the birthright of this planet where we were given dominion over the earth, and they want it back. And if they can't get it back, knowing, you know, these, these entities know our Christian Bible better than we do. They know more than that because they have even more information than we have. We're working on just enough information. God has given us enough that we can be saved and live a, you know, a good life and share the gospel. That's what our goal is. They know more than we do. They know a lot more than we do. If they, Their goal at this point is going to be to lure as many people away from the truth and away from salvation as possible. They know they're in a losing battle, but they're going to try to build... The late Dr. Chuck Missler used to say, Satan's outnumbered two to one. He's building an army. And I believe that to be true today more than ever. It doesn't have to be humans. It can be, you know, hybrids, modern-day Nephilim. It can be humans who are led astray and who are working for that cause. Well, you can see a lot of that in politics. Mm-hmm. And it's an um, entertainment industry, just to name a few. Um, and, you know, so anyone that he can get, that Satan can get, that the dark side can get on that side is building that army and is keeping people out of God's kingdom. And so that's his ultimate goal. He wants to be the counterfeit of what God is. So everything in that kingdom is going to be the counterfeit of God's kingdom, and the more people that he can lure into that counterfeit kingdom, the happier he's going to be. 100%. Yeah. And I believe that's the ultimate goal. And 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 its simplicity makes it complicated, but it's very simple. It's, it is, it, it is very simple. I'm glad that you mentioned Hollywood and politics. And, you know, the reality is there are CIA documents on this topic that have not been declassified. And many have asked, well, if, you know, it's this, it's, if, if there, it is what they're claiming and it's not happening, why wouldn't they just declassify this? But there is a deeper, darker scenario. And that pun is intended because you've had experiences that involve potential collaboration between uh, government. I don't know if I should necessarily call it government, but let's just say institutionalized um, technologies and uh, these intelligences. Can we dip our toe into that pool for just a moment? Sure. I mean, when I was being taken, the thing that struck me the most is they were humans working alongside non-human entities. And whether they were there of their free will or not, I don't know, because A, I wasn't allowed to talk to them, and B, 
you know, there's always this kind of UFO, we call it UFO brain fog when you're taken, where they kind of scramble your thoughts and it's like walking through molasses. You can't do the things you would normally do. You don't react the way you would normally react. So it's all, oh, I wish I could have done that, but I couldn't because I couldn't get my words out and make my thoughts work right, you know. Um, but there were humans. And they threatened those humans. I mean, I was witness to that. I was a part of that where they utilized me to say, you don't want this to happen to your wives, your daughters, your sisters, your friends. Um, and I felt I'm doing it to other people. And it, these people, I think, you know, I always, I like to use the story, think about if you're working for a company in the private sector, A, the private sector doesn't have to disclose to FOIA requests the way government sectors do. So that protects them. And if you're working for, you got this great job, and they say, we want to give you this top secret clearance, and and you just have to sign this NDA, and now you're going to report this new facility, and then by the time you get there, it's something like an underground base where there's humans being taken, and you're now working alongside non-human entities, and they do have an ability to affect your thoughts and how you feel, so you're not scared when you're around them. Um and now you're stuck because if you say or do anything, your family's at risk. I mean, they threatened me as a little child with my family the same way traffickers do when they traffic little children. Same thing. And as an adult, I would do anything for my children. You know, I'll protect them at any at any cost. But the cost is I know I can go to God to protect my children. That I don't have to, you know, sacrifice in other ways that God has that. But so, you know, people are put in these situations, whether they're agreeing to it or not, or whether they know what they're agreeing to or not, there are humans involved. And there have to be to some degree. And, you know, these, we know that way back to the days of Eisenhower and the Griotta Treaty, and anyone who reads my book, I'm sorry for the typo where someone put it, where the N ended up in Griotta and it says Granada Treaty. I apologize mm -hmm. for that autocorrect, um, and, um, but, you know, you go back to the Griotta Treaty where there were, and we know that the Majestic 12 existed because those documents have been released, heavily redacted, but we still have enough information to see. Um, agreements were made. They exchanged technology for humans. Yeah, you can experiment on our people, and you can give us technology, and we're going to work with you. We know these things have been going on for a long time. And our government has admitted to this now. So we're now in an age of disclosure where it's just enough that we know, but it's not enough to give us good facts yet. So it's a, it's a difficult place to be. But It is difficult because it kind of takes that, that human element when you start to realize that there is something about us that is a commodity, right? That we okay. are... We have an inherent value that uh, we, we don't exactly, you know, it's not good. Um, it's nefarious, the value that they see in us. And I find that it's very interesting that a lot of people don't believe these treaties that have been signed, as you mentioned, Eisenhower, that there is specifically uh, not one, not two, a bunch of people who have come forward and okay. talked about their value. And yet we hear terms like, you know, humans being the, um, what do they call it? The, uh, <laughs> bartering. I, I, yes, the bartering <laughs> chips, right? We well, yeah. literally like, like we, we are. Yeah, exactly. We're disposable. We're like, we're a disposable commodity that they are using to get the technology to gain more power more wealth, more ability, and it's all about this this power grab. And you know they are appealing to this the sinful nature that we have when the fall in the garden happened. And there are people who want nothing more than more power, more wealth, more fame. And that's unfortunate because they will throw other humans away as if they are just you know, discardable commodities, and that, that is a shame because we know the value of, of human life. And, and you know, it is it does go back to that age-old battle for the soul. We do have a soul. And when they create these hybrid entities, they do not have 
appear to have a soul. The ones that I have encountered did not appear to have any kind of a soul at all. And we know from um, our biblical and our other ancient texts that the Nephilim of the past didn't appear to either. They had a spirit, but not a soul. And I've often said I feel like they're trying to manufacture a soul and they just can't get it right. And I think if they keep trying, they'll figure it out. You know, maybe just a little more human DNA and a little less angelic DNA or what have you. They're not getting there, and they never will, because only God can give that. Mm -hmm. And so the more people they get to sell their soul, you know, they want that. They want that soul. There is a commodity there. It is more precious to them than all the technology and the gold and the land and everything else. That soul seems to be the most precious commodity out there. And that's why this eternal fight goes on today. God is fighting for our souls for us every single day. And we just discard them like they don't matter. And that's that's really a shame. Yeah, we are sold a bill of goods, which isn't real. We suspend reality from like what we're, we're taught and programmed. And, you know, it this these mythologies, these ancient religions, um, current current spiritualism, everything has this common thread of these residual bloodlines that seem to run through all of human history. And yep. there's this battle between good and evil. And, you know, I have to argue that DNA seems to be um, a part of it. What's your opinion on DNA and how it factors into this? Yeah, I think it is a part of it. I think that some of it is like generational um, things, generational DNA, where someone in a bloodline said, you know, that they they committed their entire family and their bloodline to the dark side or something like that, or that this DNA is easier for them to work with when it comes to trying to create a hybrid entity. Um, the DNA fits better, matches better. I think my personal thoughts on the RH negative blood types, because I am one, I think that that was a little bit of genetic manipulation on their part, on the fallen part. I think that because the, the difference between RH positive and RH negative blood is RH negative blood doesn't have this like protein coating on the outside of a cell, so it makes it easier to work with. Like I can give my blood to anyone, I'm O negative, mm -hmm. but I can't receive it from anyone, so it makes it easier to work with. And I think that might have been just something that they did to manipulate because it came from such a very specific region of the country, of the world, and then spread out. Um, but that's just a thought. No one knows for sure. Um, but so I think bloodlines have a lot to do with it in that, um, you know, there could be genetic manipulation within those bloodlines. There could be bloodlines that are not and have not been human for, you know, thousands of years, even, and that are just simply a Nephilim bloodline that continues today, but they're so human looking that you can't tell the difference. Um, and so, you know, there's just too much that we don't know and so much that we can speculate on that makes sense. Um, but unfortunately, we just don't have all the data and the facts to back it all up. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And interestingly, you and I share the same blood type and O negative is extremely resistant to a lot of genetic manipulation, as you know, to a lot of disease and possibly to other things. So it could be kind of a stumbling block for them. And that would make sense that they would want to, you know, assess, analyze and research that more. And um, some other things specifically having to do with what you mentioned about agreements that I forgot to ask you, and this is so important. And, you know, you mentioned Hollywood, you mentioned politics. And interestingly enough, these genres, uh, whether you're in politics or Hollywood, they have these agreements and they specifically are usually very similar in that they say certain words such as in all perpetuity, which means forever. And not forever. just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not just, you know, when you're dead, but the next lifetime included. And this, you know, this has been argued by other researchers. It's not my idea. A lot of times people will say, well, why does it say in all perpetuity? Obviously, can't you just say for this lifetime? But this is why these are all agreements. And sure, you might think, oh, well, it's just, you know, we're just talking about this or we're just talking about that. But this type of verbiage, this type of language, these entities are very familiar with the agreements, yeah. with the language, with the rules. 
and they are very much enforced by their human counterparts. Am I right? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes, it is a very, very legalistic environment. And that's where my friend Vicki Joy Anderson is such a an expert. She's such a, a expert in this area. But, you know, she's the one who taught me to pray that God breaks any agreements made by me or others on my behalf, known or unknown to me, so that, you know, if someone had made an agreement on my behalf that I wasn't aware of, that that could be broken. And because the Bible is full of lineages, you know, what is going on and on about bloodlines, and then he begot him, and he begot him, and he begot him, because it's important, and because the things that are promised follow through the generations and generations and generations and generations, and you have to be aware of that. And it's our responsibility to be aware of it. We don't have any excuses. Ignorance is not an excuse. And that is what they're banking on, that we'll think, oh, well, that's just something my father or my grandfather or my great-grandfather did. It doesn't affect me. It does. Mm-hmm. Everything affects you. Everything follows. It follows the generations. The generational curses follow the bloodlines follow, the DNA follows, it all works together exactly like what you said. And they are very familiar and very aware of this. And everything in that, in the whole, in God's whole kingdom, the, in the, every cr- thing of creation is extremely legalistic. It's got very specific rules and regulations that must be followed. And we have all that information at our fingertips. And we have it available to us so that we can understand how to protect ourselves. And it's very simple to protect ourselves. It doesn't take a you know, master's and PhD in theology to understand. We just have to to know you know what where to look and who to ask and, and, and or just to pray and ask, really. It's it's quite simple. But you have to, we are responsible for doing it for ourselves and for our loved ones. And it's very important and I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, there is this, such a creepy legal aspect to it. And, you know, going all the way back to the beginnings of what we consider civilization, you know, we have these laws written in stone at the ziggurat of Ur. You know, we're talking about Sumerian, okay. you know, times. And right. those laws are not that different from present day laws. And so you've yeah. nailed it. And, and, and I think, you know, we talk about at least... Uh, Biblically, there is that generational, you know, sins of the father. Yeah, you, you people sign up for this multi generationally, and many, many contactees, abductees, and their bloodlines have similar stories going back way back from a way genie, back. way back. So there's a lot of veracity to the truth there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you search your family history, you'll probably find, and if you've been an abductee or you've been um, tormented or taken or haunted or whatever you want to call it, then you search back as far as you can in your family history, you'll probably find someone somewhere way, way far back. I know in my family on one side where it goes, um, and um, you'll, you'll probably find where, where it started. And it may just be all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Who knows? But, Mm -hmm. you know, because that really is where it starts for everyone. But you're right. It's very legalistic. And there are, it doesn't matter what culture you look at. It doesn't matter how old the the, uh, literature, how old the documentation that you find. It all has the same general information. Yes. And and I'm really glad, uh, again, that, you know, there seems to be, the anthropology of it, but there's also the sanctity of faith. And this kind of leads into my next question, which is the good news. And that is, how can people avoid this happening to them? Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, not to try to sell like Vicky's book or mine, but we offer, we offer information there that's helpful in our books on our website. But you really, in your heart, you just, if you accept God, accept Jesus in your heart, let him do the work. Let him show you where to go. When I, when I told these entities, wait, you have the same creator I have. You can't touch me. In Jesus' name, you can't touch me. They were very, very unhappy <laughs> because it was true. And it didn't matter. I realized 
what was holding me back was I thought I had to live a perfect life or be a certain type of person or go to a certain type of church or do a certain type of things. And no, God, you know, my sins are forgiven. And I was, God just wanted to rescue me and save me from that. But I was my own worst enemy when it came to allowing things to happen to myself, not realizing that all I had to do was accept Accept the fact, accept Jesus into my heart, and tell these things, no, you can't touch me in Jesus' name. I don't give you permission. I revoke those permissions, and I rebuke you. And if you make that choice and just make the choice to have, you know, let God into your heart and have an eternal life with him, then you belong to God. And that doesn't get revoked. Yeah. Because you're his. Now you're his. And now you're under... You've always been his, but now you've chosen. He's already chosen you, but once you choose him, once you choose God, that changes everything. Because now that you've chosen each other, that that marriage contract is complete. That contract between you is complete, and now it's a forever thing. And that's the most amazing part, because that's what gives you the freedom from the dark things of this world. Will you still be susceptible to tax? Absolutely. Could you still be taken? Yes. But you have the tools that you need to stop it. And you have the full armor of God, as in Ephesians chapter 6, that you can put on to protect yourself. You know, don't let someone tell you, oh, I'm born again, so I can't be taken, I can't be attacked, or nothing can hurt me. No. They're still going to try. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have the now you have the tools now you have the opportunity to and you have the protection to keep yourself safe from it but know that once once you make that choice you become more appealing because the dark side already has the people who want to do bad things and who want to do evil always and don't care about god they want the people who love god to fall away <laughs> They want to get to people like you and me to hurt God. That's that's the dark side, you know, that's their pleasure. That's what they're looking for. So you just have to protect yourself. And they can't. But don't think that they won't try because they will. Mm-hmm. And it, it yeah, it, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. And so that's yeah, that's my warning because I know there are some people out there saying, "Hey, don't worry about being taken as long as you're a Christian or as long as you're born again, you're fine." Mm, you can protect yourself. You can ask God to protect you. You can tell them to go away, but it doesn't mean they won't try, and it doesn't mean you can't be taken. Hundred so, percent. But the good news is, you don't have to be. You don't have to be taken. You don't have to put up with any of that. You are. You do have everything you need to be safe. So. <laughs> word of warning but also that is the good news that you are safe you can be safe it's a it's a miraculous um you know faith-based cheat code if you look at it <laughs> like a video game it really is amazing yeah, it is. Um, it is. we don't deserve it but it's totally cheat code because we've done nothing to deserve it it is grace alone it is grace alone that we get that it is not actions it is not work it is not faith. It is grace. It is God's grace that saves us. And all we have to do is ask. You know, oh. he just waits for us to ask. And he wants to be there, and he wants to help us, and he wants to save us every single time. Beautiful stuff. That's, you know, that's what makes these conversations so worthwhile. And Karen, lastly, can we, um, I know we're wrapping up here, can we jump into yes. some of the more human technological facilities you remember going into. I, 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 I recall elevators and train-like systems and mm -hmm. what your memories are of those. And then, of course, yeah. where people can get the book, where people can contact you, etc. Okay, sure, yeah. Yeah, I do write a lot about um, the things that I remember seeing. Um, from the time I was little, I remember getting in these elevators that went down and down and down and took me into what appeared to be underground facilities. Um, and I would get on what I called the sideways elevators when I was little because I, we didn't have silent vehicles back then. So it, to me, it seemed like another elevator, but they went 
sideways or up at an angle or down at an angle, and it seemed to be some kind of a tram or a high-speed train or something um, because it had benches in it. (coughs) And those were how they would get me to wherever they were taking me at the time. Um, I would be in these facilities underground that were massive. I mean, I remember rooms that were as big as football stadiums and airports all together. Um, It was so complex. There were so many different places, so many hallways, so many rooms. There were rooms that looked like operating rooms, rooms that were just full of, of, like, steel exam tables with people. There were rooms that were little, where I would just be the only one in there on a table sometimes being examined. Or there were there was a room when I was little that I would be in with this round table and little chairs, and there would be other kids in there with me, other kids that had been taken. And some of them, I don't know if maybe they were hybrids or something because they were, seemed really messed up, like not normal, um, like they had some sort of developmental disabilities maybe. Um, it's hard to say when you're a little kid to figure out what's going on that you know when another kid isn't right, you know. Um, and we didn't talk much because we all had that kind of, we were A, we were terrified, and B, we were all kind of UFO brain fog. So it was a really weird situation to be in. Um, not that it wasn't already because the whole thing was just terrifying and ugly and scary. I mean, there just wasn't a part of it that wasn't scary. Um, you know, I saw facilities where there were these tanks, and I write a lot about this in the book, too, where there were these hallways that were just lined with what looked like aquariums in a fish store, and they had some sort of fetuses in them, Um, whether they were uh, hybrid, whether some of them maybe were animal or human or what have you, I don't know, it's hard to tell. Um, So, you know, these facilities were, they were humans, Um, and they were every kind of non-human alien entity that you've probably ever heard of was probably there. The scariest ones for me were the ones that people refer to as like a insectolin or a mantis. There's no really good way to, I don't spend a lot of time describing them in my book because they're still so terrifying for me to think about. But what I will say is their, their faces are so long horizontally and their eyes are so far apart, like on the set on the sides of their faces that, Every time I see a hammerhead shark, I freak out. <laughs> and I know that sounds weird, but it, it, it's one of those things that they kind of look like that, um, only not a shark. So um, it, that kind of helps the you know the listener get a visual of what they look like. Except they're they're ugh. anyway. Yeah, um, <laughs> I won't go down that road because that's a whole other conversation. We can have another day if you ever want to talk about the different ones. Um, so anyway, those are that's that's where I was mostly taken. It was it was always to just these you know facilities where there were humans and non-human entities working side by side. Um, you know, I didn't see humans. Up, the, the humans weren't working on me, like weren't doing the exams and things like that. They were always like in the background, and I don't know what their jobs were, or what they were doing. I never asked. Um, I just saw them there. So, um, does that answer your question? Before I go on, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And do you have any more questions before I tell people where they can find me? No, let's tell them. Okay, <laughs> you can find me. Uh, my website is KarenWilkinsonAuthor.com. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram, also under my name, Karen Wilkinson, or look up Karen Wilkinson Author. There's a little blue check mark, so you know you found me. I try to post all my interviews there. Um, I don't get on there every single day, so if you message me through there, be patient. It takes me a while to wade through because I get a lot of junk messages that way. But you can reach out to me through my website. I love to hear from people. I hear from people all the time. I will get back to you if you ask me to. Um, And it does take me a while sometimes, depending on how many messages I've got in my inbox. But um, you can find me at events. I usually am wherever L.A. Marzulli is going to be. Um, so if you follow his events page, that's probably where I'll be. And I try to post on social media where I'm going to be as well. And I'll eventually have an events page on my website once I can get in there and update it. <laughs> I just don't have time because we've been so ter- so incredibly busy. But um, I'm grateful for that. The book is Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest, and it's available exclusively at net or 
wherever I am in person, we are selling the book, and I love to meet people in person, sign books, talk to people, share stories, that kind of thing. So please, if you're going to be in the area where one of the events is, please come and see me. I just love to meet people in person. Yeah, and you are really busy. I've been keeping tabs yeah. on you, and um, wow. Um, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> It is busy. God's keeping me busier than I, I ever imagined. It's a blessing. I just hope that um, I can, you know, reach everyone who wants to talk to me and um, help out wherever I possibly can because I understand how terrifying this is, how life-altering it is, and I do want people to know it's okay. It's okay to talk about and that you can get through it and your life can go on and be better. And be better. These things don't have to rule your life. You have... God has a better future for you. Amen. Thanks. Amen. And thanks for shedding so much light on a sacred yet dark mystery. You're giving listeners knowledge of this remarkable phenomenon. You are an absolute blessing in this space for people who are involved with this complex enigma. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for what you do, Karen. And... Wow. Yeah, you're an extremely busy person. I really want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day to talk to me. Oh, gosh, Ryan, thank you so much. You are such a blessing to me. You have no idea. Your words are so kind, and that means so much. I just hope that, you know, there's, if there's someone who needs to reach out to me, please do, because that's what I'm here for, and I just appreciate your love and support. It means the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for what you are doing and keep doing what you're doing. And I just pray that God will bless you and bless all the work you're doing. Thank you, Ryan. Man. Wow. I wish, I mean, anyway, I wish more people were as extremely helpful going into the, you know, nature of this spiritual yet temporal reality. There's more going on behind the scenes than we may ever know. And this remarkable phenomenon will turn you into a believer if you follow it enough. So there we have it. Big questions, big answers. What exactly do they want from us? Well, it isn't good. What happens when people are abducted? Also not good. But the good news is there is an answer. And that answer is faith-based. We are... uh, connected to something more powerful, it seems, than many of the spiritual enemies we may encounter. Thanks so much for listening in. Definitely support Karen. Check out lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I dot net. You can also access her book at karenwilkinsonauthor.com. K-A-R-I-N-W-I-L-K-I-N-S-O-N-A-U-T-H-O-R dot com. Karen Wilkinson, author dot com. She's got a lot going on. She's been grinding. She's killing it. She's so busy right now. Uh, Just blessed that she took some time out of her busy day to talk to us. But now at least we know what lurks in the dark what they're after, and what we can do to protect ourselves. Until next time, keep your eyes to the skies, feet on the ground, but don't forget to take a look around. Follow me with your darkest eyes Follow me with your shape-shifting smiles And I see you Maybe the Illuminati occult dawn trap Silver discs and hidden files And we